Hello everyone, this is Mr. Couple. In this video, I'll be talking to you about the history of gravity. That is, human attempts to understand and explain the motion of the cosmos. When we look up at the night sky and we see the stars and the planets behave the way they do, we want to understand why. In this video, I'll be highlighting some of the historical developments that led to our modern understanding of gravity. Part one, star trails. Check out what happens if you leave a camera out overnight and then digitally speed up the footage afterwards. This type of photography is called time-lapse photography. And we're able to see long stretches of time compressed and sped up into much shorter amounts of time. And when you do this, you actually notice that the stars, or rather the sky, moves. And this is one of the weirdest things, because when you don't really think about it, when you're out at night and you look up at the stars, you never really consider the fact that all of the stars appear to be moving. These star trails reveal the motion of the earth. And you'll notice that those trails are longer the further away they are from the North Star. And so that little dot right there, that star that's barely moving at all, that's Polaris, that's the North Star. And these star trails are created not because the stars themselves are moving, but because the earth is rotating. And so these star trail images show the apparent motion of the stars in the night sky due to the Earth's rotation. These streaks of light across the sky are due to what photographers call long exposures. And so the further away you are from Polaris, the longer these streaks become. This is also visible from space on board the International Space Station. So here's a star trails image that was taken by an astronaut on the International Space Station. I wanna show you this awesome video. This is from Alpha Phoenix YouTube channel. Let's just watch it. So what he's doing is he's rotating the video and look at the sky now. Remember before those star trails, those streaks of light across the sky? This video just really shows you that those streaks weren't caused by the motion of the stars. They were caused by the motion of the earth. And so when we rotate the earth, when we spin the earth in this video, we notice that the stars are stationary and that it's actually the earth that's spinning. And if we want to further understand the motion of the stars, we're gonna need to figure out a way to cancel out this motion of the Earth. Part two, the wanderers. What I'm going to show you is a series of images that were generated within a planetarium software called Stellarium. And what this software does is it gives us a view of the night sky. You can see in the lower left corner that I currently have the software set to show us the view of Kansas City on November 1st, 2020 at six o'clock in the morning. What I'm going to do is I'm going to advance this image by 24 hours, four times per second. What this will do is it'll cancel out the rotation of the earth. If we go to exactly 24 hours later, then the earth will have completed one revolution. And so we won't see the stars trail in streaks across the sky any longer. So we're gonna to try to cancel out the rotation of the earth. So let's see what happens if I show you four nights per second from November 1st to December 31st. Here we go. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the stars still appear to move. And so why is that happening? Well, it's because the earth actually undergoes two movements. The first movement 
is the rotation of the earth as it spins, which creates the day night cycle. But the second motion of the earth is an orbital motion. And we're not canceling out the orbital motion by going 24 hours at a time. And so the stars are still moving because the earth is still moving around the sun in its orbit. And we haven't been able to cancel out that motion. What I want you to look at in this image is that not all of the stars are moving in the same direction. Some of the stars are wandering. There are two wanderers visible from this sequence from November 1st to December 31st. And I want you to try to see if you can find the wandering stars. See if you can find those wanderers. I'll show the video one more time before I reveal to you the position of the wanderers. Well, did you spot the wanderers? Let's go back to the beginning and we'll pause it at the moment where both of them are visible, which is right here. The two wanderers are this star and that star. The first people to discover that some of the stars move and behave differently than the rest of the stars were the ancient Greeks. And they named these stars Asters Planetae, which means in the Greek language, wandering stars. Asters is for stars and planetae is for wandering. Now, what exactly are these Asters planetae? What are these wandering stars? Well, it turns out that they're actually planets. I'm sure from the planetae that you figured out that these are the planets. And so the planets in this picture are Venus and Mercury. And the word planet literally means wanderer. So these stars were called the wanderers or the planets. And that's why to this day, we still call them planets. All right, let's go see what the sky looks like facing towards the Southwest at six o'clock at night. We'll do the exact same thing from November 1st to December 31st, four nights per second. Let's see if you can spot the wanderers in this view. Let's do that again. Remember what you're looking for are stars that are not moving with all the background stars that they're moving differently. It can be a little bit trickier to find the wanderers in this video because these planetae are much further away from the sun than Venus and Mercury were. And so they move much more gradually. And so they can kind of be hidden, but I'll play it one more time and see if you guys can spot them. All right, so let's go ahead and reveal the location of these planetae. What you'll notice is that there are two stars that slowly get closer together and then exactly overlap each other. And then one of them passes behind the other. And those are the wanderers. They are Jupiter and Saturn. And one of the craziest things when I was putting this together was I realized on December 21st this year, Jupiter and Saturn are going to appear as a single star in the night sky. Check this out. We can go back and watch this again. So watch, they're getting closer and closer. And this is the first time this has happened since the year 1225, where Jupiter and Saturn are exactly aligned. Here we go, right now. On December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn will appear as a double planet or a double star in the sky. And this hasn't happened since the year 1225. So hopefully it's not a cloudy night on December 21st at 6 p.m. So we can go check this out.
as humans discovered the wanderers or the planets, we started to try to track their motion in the sky. And so we needed an instrument to do that. And so this device is called an astrolabe. And the way that an astrolabe works is you look through one end of the device as you rotate it and you orient it and position it so it's pointing towards the star or towards the planet. And then you use this device, the markings around the circular edges, to measure the angle. So an astrolabe is an ancient astronomical device. It functions as an inclinometer used by astronomers to measure the altitude above the horizon of a celestial body. Day or night, it can be used to identify stars or planets, to determine local latitude given local time, and vice versa, to survey or to triangulate. So this is an astrolabe. So what we want to do is we want to go back to that video that we were looking at earlier of Venus and Mercury, the one that I created by looking at 24 hour periods. And what we want to do is use an astrolabe to measure the angle that the star makes to the horizon. And so we'll point it at Venus and we'll make a graph of that altitude or that angle of inclination. We'll make that graph at 6 a.m. throughout the year 2020. And this is what we get when we're looking at Venus. So the first thing to notice is that Venus isn't always visible at 6 a.m. And that's because sometimes it's on the other side of the sun. And so it's visible during daytime. So if we just looked at the sky at 6 a.m., we would see Venus at these angles. What about Mercury? Well, let's do the same thing. So the first thing you'll notice is that Mercury is visible at a bunch of times. So there's three observational windows of where we see Mercury at 6 a.m. Mercury orbits much more quickly than Venus. And so that's why Mercury is making three appearances while Venus is only making one long appearance. What we'll do is we'll look at this day. Ah, this is nearish to November 1st. And we'll record the angle of Venus and we see that we get about, what is this, like 20-ish degrees? And we record Mercury and we get about six degrees. So Mercury was down here, so we see that six degrees. And then Venus is up here, we see the 20 degrees. Now what we want to do is play this over time. So when I hit play, we'll notice that the day or the night is going to move forward in time. And we can see how these angles change over time. Mercury has just dropped below the horizon, but we can still see Venus as the angle gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally Venus disappears. And now we can see that Venus and Mercury are no longer visible on December 31st. So this is just an example of how we can use these wanderers to track data and to collect data over time to try to visualize and understand the motion of the planets. And so what it appears to us at this point is that it seems like the planets are going around the earth, that the planets are moving around the earth and creating these loops. So there's one loop around the earth and it comes back and it comes back and in Venus, we just see one loop. And so we sort of start to track the planets and we start to see that there's motion seemingly around the earth. And this is where we're going to pick up in the next video where we start to talk about some models of the solar system. But before we do that, I just wanted to show you guys something incredible that most people don't realize. Planets are visible with the naked eye. You don't need a telescope to see a planet. You can go out and if you look in the right spot, you can see planets with your own eyes. And so why don't you give it a go? Anytime in the next month or so, if you go outside, this is November to December, 2020. If you go outside at 6 a.m. and look to the east or 6 p.m. and look to the west, you'll be able to see the planets that I just showed you in this video. Part three, Aristotle's model. So what we just saw in part two was that the planetary data that we've collected or the angle of elevation data revealed the apparent motion of the planets around the earth that we saw those loops as the planets were orbiting around. 
So Aristotle uses this data to propose the following model. So Aristotle thinks that the earth is at the center of the solar system and all of the planets are attached to these crystalline spheres. You'll notice that the furthest most sphere is where all the background stars are. And so that's why all the background stars move with each other is because they're all attached to the same sphere. Now the other planets are attached to their own sphere, which is why those planets move and behave differently than the background stars. The reason the planets are wanderers is because the, each planet is attached to its own sphere. So Aristotle says the planets are attached to crystalline spheres which rotate around the Earth. And this model is called a geocentric model of the solar system. Geocentric means that the Earth is at the center. And this very accurately describes the motion of the planets that we saw and fits really well with the angle data that we collected. This is Aristotle's model of the solar system. And one thing that I always like to point out is that why did Aristotle make the spheres that the planets were affixed to? Why did he say it was made out of crystalline? Why not like rock or wood? And it's cool because right, we can't see the spheres. When we look up at the sky and we watch the planets wander around the sky, we don't actually see the spheres that they're attached to. So Aristotle imagined that, you know, everything that moves has to have a force that's making it move. Remember that was Aristotle's violent versus natural motion. And so he thought that he needed something to explain this motion of the planets. And so he created this idea of these crystalline spheres as being the driver or the cause of the motion of the planets and they're wandering across the sky. Part four, the retrograde of Mars. What you're seeing right now is a video that I recorded inside Universe Sandbox. This is a game that you can download on Steam. It is not free, but I was very fortunate to have one of my former students, Alexander Aguirre. He gave me this on Steam as a gift for my birthday. And I've been using it ever since to teach students about physics. So what we're going to see here is a view from the earth at the center of our view. And when I hit play, we're going to see this simulation play out at a rate of about 13 days per second. So you'll be seeing roughly two weeks per second happening. Now, since we're out in space, we don't have to worry about a day night cycle happening. And what I want you guys to do is to look at Mars. It's in the upper right-hand corner. You can see Mars and I want you to follow Mars. So here we go. So as the video starts, we see Mars moving to the left. You know, it's orbiting around the earth, just like Aristotle says, but then all of a sudden Mars goes backwards. What? And then it goes back to going forward again. This loop that Mars does, this loop is called a retrograde motion. Let's watch that one more time. We can see Mars is progressing. This is direct motion, then retrograde motion. Mars appears to go backwards and then it goes back to direct motion again. What could possibly be causing this? Mars can't be attached to a crystalline sphere, can it? Why would the sphere suddenly change direction of motion? That doesn't make sense. And so this is actual real. This is what Mars really does. This is an actual photograph that was taken, multiple exposures, kind of like the star trail, but this photo was taken over about six months time period. And so each night that the photo was taken, we put where Mars was. So you can see that Mars over a period of multiple days or multiple weeks is appearing to go in this loop motion. And this motion is called the retrograde motion. And so you can see here over each of these dots is one month later. So over a period of time of roughly six months or so, we can see Mars trace out this loop, this retrograde motion. Retrograde motion in astronomy is in general, orbital or rotational motion of an object that appears to be in the direction opposite to that of other bodies within the system as observed from a particular vantage point. Remember for this observation, we were looking from the perspective of the earth. The term retrograde is from the Latin word retrogradus, backward step, the affix retro, meaning 
backwards and gradius meaning step. So that's why we call this the retrograde is because the planet appears to take a step back and then go forward again. So what could possibly be causing this retrograde motion? Aristotle's model of the solar system has no explanation for the retrograde. Aristotle's motion can explain why the planets move or appear to move to us, but they can't explain why they take this backward step. What's going on here? So the first astronomer to figure this out, his name was Claudius Ptolemy, and he was alive from the years 90 to 168. What Ptolemy proposed was a slight tweak to Aristotle's model. Now remember, when evidence disagrees with an explanation, there's two possibilities, right? Either the evidence is wrong or the theory is wrong. And at this point, we're very sure that our evidence is right, that Mars goes through this retrograde. So Ptolemy knows that Aristotle's model must be wrong. So Ptolemy has a decision to make. Does he tweak the model or does he throw it out? Well, Ptolemy decides that for the most part, Aristotle's model makes sense to him. And so he's just going to make one minor adjustment to fix it. So here's what he says. The planet isn't stuck to the sphere, but actually there's two spheres. The main sphere is called the deferent and the main sphere goes around the earth like Aristotle said, but the planet itself is actually attached to a smaller sphere called the epicycle. And the smaller sphere rotates as the larger sphere also rotates. And so it creates this double loop effect. The big loop of the orbit is from the deferent. And then these smaller loops are from the epicycle. Ptolemy says the planets must be affixed to their crystalline spheres on an epicycle. This can be kind of tricky to understand. So I created an animation to help you guys visualize it. So here you can see Mars going around the earth. And so we're explaining the retrograde while Mars appears to move backwards. And it's because Mars is actually moving on an epicycle attached to the deferent. So you actually have two loops that are happening here. The one loop is the main loop around the earth. And the other loop is the smaller loop in the epicycle. And this creates motions like now where Mars goes backwards, then forwards, then backwards, then forwards. And so Ptolemy was able to explain the retrograde motion of the planets by introducing epicycles into Aristotle's model. And it wasn't just Mars that had an epicycle. Ptolemy proposed that every single planet is on an epicycle. And he just adjusted the rates at which these epicycles rotated to then match the observational data that was collected for each planet. Now, Ptolemy's model stood firm for about 1500 years. We used it for sailing, for navigating, but as time went on, we noticed that the planets sort of tended to drift off from where Ptolemy's model predicted they would be. And so the solution was to add more epicycles. And it got to the point where there were so many epicycles that this model of the solar system was just so complicated that it was just almost impossible to figure out what was going on. And so along came a scientist named Nicholas Copernicus. And Copernicus proposed that this system has a much, much simpler explanation. We don't need to invoke these epicycles. Rather, we can just toss out the whole concept of the crystalline spheres entirely and just say that the planets, including the Earth, orbit around the sun and that the solar system isn't geocentric with the Earth at the center, but rather heliocentric with the sun at the center. And Copernicus realized that this would explain the retrograde motion of the planets much more simply than Ptolemy's epicycle model. Here's how it works. The retrograde motion is caused by the Earth passing Mars. Since the Earth is closer to the Sun, the Earth moves quicker in its orbit around the Sun. And so the retrograde motion is really an illusion that's caused by the faster Earth passing by the slower Mars where Mars appears to go backwards. The best way to think about this is to imagine when you're in a car. If you're in a car and you drive past a slower moving car, 
from your perspective, it's going to look like that slower car was moving backwards. And it's not that Mars was ever actually physically moving backwards. It was rather that us, the observers on the planet Earth, which is in motion, according to Copernicus, that we passed by Mars and that made it look like Mars was going backwards, that Mars was taking a backward step. But really, it was just the Earth that was passing by Mars. So Copernicus says that the retrograde motion is an illusion created by the motion of the Earth. And so it's not that Mars is going through two loops. It's that Earth is also a planet. And so the second loop, you don't need an epicycle to explain that retrograde, that second loop of Mars. You just need Earth to be making its own loop around the sun. And so you can see in this animation that it's when the Earth passes by Mars that Mars appears to move backwards from our perspective. So just to sort of put this into perspective, here are the two models. It's the Ptolemaic model versus the Copernican model. In the Ptolemaic model, we explain the retrograde motion by saying that the Earth is at the center and Mars is attached to an epicycle. In the Copernican model, we say that the sun is at the center and the Earth is a planet. And so our observations of Mars are taken from a moving planet and that's what creates the retrograde motion of the planets. Now here's the problem. Both of these models explain and are able to successfully predict the location of the planets. In fact, both of these models predict and map out the location of the planets in perfect agreement with each other. So how do we know which one is right? Well, there's this problem solving principle known as Occam's razor. And Occam's razor can be used in situations like this, where you have multiple explanations that explain the same thing. What Occam's razor says is that all things being equal, the simplest explanation is more likely to be true. So given we have these two models that explain the motion of the planets that we observe, particularly the retrograde motion, we have these two models that agree with each other, that both make predictions that match. These are equal predictions. What Occam's razor says, this principle of problem solving, is that the simpler model is more likely to be true. And since the heliocentric model is much more simple with its circular orbits and the planets each going around the sun, than this crazy epicycle geocentric system, then by Occam's razor, we conclude that the Copernican model, the heliocentric model, is more likely to be true. But that doesn't mean that we've proven the Copernican model. We've just decided that this seems like it's the right way to go because it makes more sense and it's more simple. To really understand which model is correct, we're going to need to go even further and collect even more accurate data. And we'll talk about that in the next part. Part five, Tycho's observations. Now Tycho Brahe was an interesting fellow. So he actually had his own preferred model of the solar system where he said that the earth is at the center, but the planets go around the sun and the sun goes around the earth. Well, the sun and the moon go around the earth. And so you can see in this picture here that it's, it's sort of like the Ptolemaic model. It's sort of like the Aristotle model where you still have that fixed rotating sphere of stars and the planets on their own spheres. The difference though, is that the earth is at the center and only the sun and the moon go around the earth, that all the other planets go around the sun. And so Tycho Brahe really liked this model. It was his preferred model. And so he was saying, you know what? What if the planets orbit the sun and the sun orbits the earth? What if our solar system is sort of this binary system? And Tycho Brahe is saying, you know what? We can't really tell. We need better data. We need to collect more accurate elevation or angle data of the planets over longer amounts of time. So Tycho Brahe, when he was 17 years old, he said this, I've studied all available charts of the planets and stars and none of them match the others. There are just as many measurements and methods as there are astronomers and all of them disagree. 
What's needed is a long-term project with the aim of mapping the heavens conducted from a single location over a period of several years. And so Tycho Brahe, with his vast amounts of wealth and his rich resources as a nobleman, he set out to build this single location. He created an observatory. And so here's an image, an artistic rendering of what his observatory may have looked like. You can see in the background, he has all sorts of different instrumentations. And in the foreground, we have this arc. And what he's using is there's this building where he's literally got this massive mural painted on the wall where you can actually line up and look at the stars from different angles and then measure the angle of inclination of those stars by using this giant, this is basically like a gigantic protractor. And then those tools in the background are also important in ensuring. So Tycho Brahe built a ton of these devices. This is basically like a super advanced astrolabe. It's just massive. And the more big you make these objects, the more precise you can measure these angles. And so this device that we're looking at here, this was able to take angle measurements that was accurate to within 0.008 degrees. And so you can see what Tycho Brahe is really getting at here is he's saying, we need better data. We need to collect more accurate long-term data from a single location so we can really nail down precisely how the planets are moving. The only problem was Tycho Brahe was a brilliant engineer. He was brilliant at building these devices and collecting the data, but he was not brilliant enough to figure out the mathematical underpinning of this data. So here's an example of what Tycho Brahe recorded. These are his Mars angle observations over the span of roughly 20 years. So what Tycho Brahe needed to do was he needed to calculate the orbit of the planets from this data. But this curve fitting process was extremely complicated and he wasn't able to grapple with the mathematics to do this. You know, back then without computers and things like that, doing a curve fit like this, where you're taking a curve, that's the red curve and fitting it to the data was not an easy task to accomplish. And so Tycho Brahe needed someone who was smart enough and knew the mathematics who could do this calculation. And so Tycho Brahe seeked out the assistance of the greatest mathematician of his time named Johannes Kepler. Johannes Kepler looked at Tycho Brahe's data and he figured out the following information. So he figured out the distance from the sun for each planet and he figured out the orbital period of each planet. The orbital period is the time it takes the planet to go around the sun. And so here we see this data presented in meters for the distance and seconds for the period. Now what Kepler needs to do is he wants to find some sort of pattern in this data. He wants to find some sort of organizational structure that reveals to us a sense of order in the solar system. And so what he does is he decides to graph the data. So he makes a plot of distance from the sun on the vertical axis and the orbital period on the horizontal axis. And he uses this technique known as logarithms. And I know you guys haven't studied logarithms yet, but this graph, do you see how it looks weird? How like the lines aren't evenly spaced? That's because this graph is made on what's called a log scale. And a log scale is just instead of counting linearly where each space is equal to the same amount, a log scale counts by powers of 10. So we can see down here, this is one times 10, the E means times 10. This is one times 10 to the zero. So that's one. The log scale graph starts at one. And then we go up to the next increment. This is 10. So between here and here, there are nine spacings. Then we go to the next one. And now we're at a hundred. We just jumped from 10 to a hundred. So within this interval is actually 90. And we go to the next one, we're at a thousand. So we just jumped 900. So that each interval contains an increasing amount of data. And the reason you use a log graph when you're graphing the planetary data is because look at these numbers. These numbers are enormous. And so that's why Kepler used a log scale to plot this data. And so what he found was a curve fit on this data with this equation, where the distance from the sun, which we'll call that R, is equal to this number, this is a million, times the period 
raised to the 0 0.67 power. And so when he graphed the planets, he noticed this power law, this power trend that fit the data perfectly for each planet. Now what he does is he solves this out. So the next step is to realize, you know what, this 1 million, let's just call that K, where K stands for Kepler's constant. Now, what we realize is that that power is 0 0.67. Well, that's just to the two thirds. That's two thirds. So we realize that this is R is equal to some constant number times T to the two third power. Now, what we'll do is we'll take the, we'll raise each side of this equation to the third power. So what happens then is you'll get R to the third power. And on the right hand side, the two thirds, when you raise it to the third power, will just become a two. Now the K has also been raised to the third power, but it's still constant. If you take a constant number and you raise it to the third power, it's still a constant number. So we're just gonna keep calling it K for constant. And so here's what Kepler has realized now. If we divide both sides of this equation by T squared, we get this result. It says R cubed over T squared is a constant value. So what Kepler has realized is if we take this data this planetary data that is determined, if we cube the radius and divide it by the period squared, we should get a constant number. And this discovery is called Kepler's third law of planetary motion. And sure enough, here's the data table showing that this actually works. So if we take five times 10 to the 10 and we cube it, we get 1.9 times 10 to the 32. If we take the period, and square it, we get this. And then if we take both these values, r cubed and t squared, and we divide them by each other, we get this number. And lo and behold, that number is the same for every planet. And that number is Kepler's constant, 3.4 times 10 to the 18 meters cubed per second squared. So where do we go from here? Well, Kepler was never really able to figure out what this meant but he knows that there's harmony in the solar system, that every planet has something in common with each other, r cubed over t squared. Kepler used this as evidence that the planets go around the sun. The reason that there's harmony in this model, the reason the data matches up in the way it does is because the earth is a planet and what do all the planets have in common that gives them this constant motion is that all the planets go around the sun. And so this constant value, 3.4 times 10 to the 18, has something to do with the sun. Kepler has brought harmony to the solar system. This is called the law of harmony. Part six, theories of gravity. The first theory we're going to look at is Newton's law of gravity. There's this famous story where Newton was sitting under an apple tree and he saw an apple fall out of the tree to the ground. Most versions of the story have the apple hitting him on the head, but that was probably unlikely. But as Newton sat under the tree and he watched the apple fall to the ground, he realized that the force that's pulling the apple to the ground must be the same force that's keeping the moon in its circular orbit around the earth. Now remember, Newton has invented the laws of motion. He knows that if an object is going to accelerate, there has to be a force on it. Well, it's very obvious that the apple is pulled to the ground by the earth. But what's not so obvious is that the moon is pulled in its orbit by the earth as well. This image is showing you Isaac Newton's conceptualization of gravity, that the moon and the earth are experiencing a gravitational interaction. And so the reason why the moon is able to move along a circular orbit around the earth is because the force on the moon from the earth is perpendicular to the velocity of the moon. And so this causes the direction of motion of the moon to change, but not the speed of the moon. And thus the moon is stuck in orbit. It's not falling towards the earth, it's falling around the earth. Notice that its velocity is tangent to the circular path. What Newton is proposing is that there is a force on the moon from the earth and an equal force 
on the Earth from the moon, that any two masses attract each other and that masses gravitationally interact and pull each other together. This is called Newton's law of universal gravitation. The way that it's stated is with this equation, F equals G M M over R squared, where F is the force of gravity. Notice that there are two forces because there are two masses. Each mass exerts a force on the other mass because of Newton's third law. Big M is standing for the mass of the earth. Little M is standing for the mass of the moon. And R is the distance between their centers. So we could read this down here. This is from Wikipedia. Newton's law of universal gravitation is usually stated as that every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. The publication of the theory has become known as the first great unification as it marked the unification of the previously described phenomenon of gravity on Earth with known astronomical behaviors. So what that's saying is that Newton's law of gravity is a universal law of gravity because it doesn't just explain the motion of the apple as it accelerates towards the Earth, but it also explains the motion of the moon as it accelerates towards the Earth. And Newton went on to show that you can create Kepler's third law from this law. The mathematics of that are a little bit beyond what we have time for, but just know that Isaac Newton was able to take this law of gravity and mathematically show that Kepler's third law is a consequence of this law of gravity. What Newton showed was that Kepler's constant K was actually contained within it the mass of the sun. And in fact, Kepler's third law isn't just true for the planets going around the sun, but Kepler's third law is true for any satellite orbiting any central body. And this Kepler's third law can also be used to explain satellites going around the earth and moons going around Jupiter. And so Isaac Newton has unified the idea that the things that happen here on earth with gravity of earth also explain the motion of the entire universe and all the objects and all the planets in their orbits around the sun. Where do we go from here? Well, this is where it starts to get a little bit weird. So Albert Einstein has a crazy idea. What Einstein proposes is that it's actually not the masses that attract each other, but actually massive objects like the earth, they curve space time. And then when you move through this curve space time, it creates the illusion of gravity. And so in this animation, you can see that the space around the earth has this curved space time, that space itself appears to be falling towards the earth. And it's not so much that space is moving, but rather that if you were standing on the surface of the earth, you would see space moving. And so the apple that you release on earth doesn't actually move. It's really the earth that's moving through space time up to the apple. And this is just like the weirdest thing ever, but this is called Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's a geometric theory of curved space time that perfectly explains all the observations of the universe that we've ever taken. Einstein's theory of general relativity also proposes the existence of things like black holes. You can also do all sorts of crazy things like wormholes and time travel. All of these things are possible from inside Einstein's equations of general relativity. This is extremely high level, advanced, complicated mathematics that you generally don't see until after you get a physics degree and you go to off to get a PhD in graduate school. So what Einstein is telling us is that gravity isn't really a force, that massive objects don't attract each other like Newton says, but rather masses bend and curve space-time and objects move through curved space-time and give us the illusion of gravity. So we'll watch this one more time. So the apple is above the earth. Notice that the apple is fixed in space. The apple is not moving, that it's actually the earth. If you're standing on the surface of the earth, 
you would appear to be moving upward. And so Einstein says that because of the curvature of space, that it gives the illusion that the apple is falling. But really what's happening is the surface of the earth is stopping you from bending with space time. And so it's the apple that's really following the correct path, the, the rest path, the gravity free path is the path that the apple is on. But you standing on the surface of the earth are actually in a non inertial frame that's accelerating outward to catch up to the apple. This is the craziest stuff. You don't really need to understand it, but just know that Einstein's theory is the accepted theory today that explains gravity and has passed every single test that we've ever thrown at it. And that's the history of gravity. This is Mr. Keppel signing off.